You're listening to the Assembly Call IU podcast and postgame show. The place where Indiana fans across the globe hang out online after every IU basketball game. Join us for our live broadcasts on Thursday nights and immediately following every IU game at our website, assemblycall.com. That's assemblycall.com. Welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most urgent topics in the never dull world of Indiana basketball. This is our 116th edition of Assembly Call Radio, and it is our 508th episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the evening of Thursday, April 4th, 2019. I'm your host, Jared Morris. And let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Hoosier Proud banner moment. And Indiana is the national champion. When it comes down, Indiana will be champion. Martin takes the shot. Oh, who the one the national championship? This week's banner moment occurred at 4.36 p.m. on Wednesday afternoon when Jeff Rabjohns of 24-7 Sports posted about the latest prospect to schedule an official visit to Bloomington, which capped an encouraging week of news when it comes to potential newcomers for next season. The subject of Rabjohns' post was Lester Quinones, a four-star guard out of Florida who will be visiting Bloomington the weekend of April 13th, and yes, that is little five-week smart scheduling by the IU staff. Quinones is known as one of the best shooters in the class of 2019, which is really all any IU fan needs to know to be excited about this development. For a while now, we've been telling you not to pay too much attention to individual recruits until official visits get scheduled and taken. Because until that happens, it's tough to know if there is legitimate interest on both sides. Well, here we go. Memphis is the perceived leader in this recruitment, but Archie and his staff will at least get their shot. And that wasn't the only piece of interesting recruiting news during the same week in which Clifton Moore and Jake Forrester announced their intentions to transfer and Romeo made his NBA departure official. More on that later. Archie Miller hosted center Joey Brunk for an unofficial visit, which by all accounts went well. Brunk seems especially important now, given that he can play immediately, will have two years of eligibility, and the Hoosiers are suddenly much thinner along the front court. And perhaps most intriguing of all, the staff upheaval at Alabama and LSU seems to have opened the door for Indiana to re-enter the recruitment of Trendon Watford. During his recent appearance on the Hoosier Hysterics podcast, Christian Watford said Indiana has a legit shot, especially if Romeo Langford goes pro, which has now happened. And while it still seems likely the Hoosiers are facing an uphill battle for Trendon, it's encouraging to be back in the ballgame for a player from an incredible family whose size and skill set would fit perfectly on next season's roster. The Hoosiers now project to have three open scholarships. Will they get Kinones, Brunk, and Trendon? Almost assuredly not. Two out of three would be incredible. Even just one out of three would be solid given the overall landscape. Regardless, as roster turnover season heats up, the Hoosiers seem to be in interesting positions with a number of players who would fill specific needs for next season and beyond. Now we'll see which of them Archie Miller is able to close. All right, now let me introduce my esteemed co-host for this week's show to my left. He is the Chris Beard of Girls Youth Sports Coaching in Cincinnati. He is the president emeritus of the Robert Johnson Fan Club, and he remains one of the world's most respected and fun-loving bracketologists. Well, it's been a fun week, Jared. Let me tell you, this is fun. This kind of game is fun. This was fun. All right, well, this was fun. He is Andy Bottoms. Andy, what is your Bottoms line on the last week in Indiana basketball? Well, so far, given the way my week has gone, non IU basketball related, I would not categorize this week as fun. So at least it changed things up a little bit. Oh, not bad, not not terrible, not enjoyable, but not terrible. Um, so, I mean, from an IU perspective, uh, we you just you feel like you're going to get through one of these where you, off seasons where you don't have a ton of roster turnover, and then you turn around and and look and uh, I, I don't know that in a vacuum any of the departures were surprising. Uh, you know, Clifton's in particular, I don't think people were surprised by I, Romeo, certainly not the Forster one. When you when you look back at it, we texted about this a little bit earlier in the week. When you kind of put some of the pieces together, it makes a little bit more sense. But you, you do have a situation now where you're um, you, you certainly have more roster turnover than you thought you would, and and more uh, scholarships to work with. So it'll be interesting to to see. You know, you, you mentioned a number of guys there. 
uh, what really happens. And we, we categorize this off season as one that was going to be pretty interesting for a number of reasons. And, uh, you know, if, if these recent departures are any indication, there's going to be uh, a lot of people, you know, running to scramble to get YouTube highlights of various high school or, uh, or college players to figure out where they might fit in and how they might fit in. But uh, I, I do think it, it gives an, another opportunity to kind of find some guys that fill uh, needs on the team and, uh, and, and go from there. So, uh, it'll be, uh, you know, like I said, we talked about this off season being interesting and it's, uh, you know, through just a couple weeks, which it seems like even more, uh, quite frankly than that, since the, uh, Wichita state game, uh, it, it, things are shaping up to be pretty interesting. And, uh, and, and now we'll kind of see, there's a lot of, a lot of variability in what the roster might look like. And that's, uh, intriguing in some ways. And, um, I, I look forward to figuring out who's going to fill these spots and us all getting really excited and, uh, and, and creating the idealized version of all of these guys and, uh, and talking ourselves into why this can be a Final Four team. That's what off-seasons are for, Andy. Absolutely, it is. <laughs> Lots of time. <laughs> and to my right, he is a senior writer for the big lead, no longer just a columnist, a senior writer. He's a co-host of The Hangover. And with Romeo Langford's announcement on Thursday that he will be entering the NBA draft, it means that Ryan has once again been proven incorrect with his proclamations of a player being on a two-year plan. Romeo Langford was on a two-year plan. He is Ryan Phillips. Ryan, what is your rant? That's, that's <laughs> not even funny. It's not even... Just in case anybody's watching or listening, I did not say Romeo was on a two-year plan. Somebody has doctored that footage. That is not, that's not cool, man. To knock on my credibility. I, I, ugh, Romeo Lankford was on a two-year plan. Yeah. Sounds, sounds very smooth. Sounds, I hear no edit in there at all. like me. <laughs> uh, the second part of that almost doesn't even sound like Ryan, to be perfectly honest. I know, honestly. It was, it was a very bad recording from the old yeah, days. From the old days. <laughs> uh, Anyway, I, you know, we're talking about the roster turnover and and you say that, you know, there's more roster turnover than you thought. And and I agree to some to some extent, Andy, but I also think that it's the core of the roster is going to be the same. I mean, it, it's going to be what we expected. Romeo's gone. We expected that. Uh, Clifton Moore, I think most people expected to transfer there of, the, you know, of of the group of like Clifton Moore, Jake Forrester, uh, Race Thompson, you know, uh, Jerome Hunter, those those kind of forward guys. Uh, I think that most people expected Clifton gone. And I think there was an outside shot all along that Jake Forrester would be gone. Um, it, you know, and if you look at it from a rational perspective, if Joey Bronk's going to come on and given a lot of the indications, it seems like Joey Bronk really wants to be at Indiana. I don't know if that's going to end up being the final destination for him, but it seems like he's really interested in Indiana and Indiana is certainly very interested in him uh, with how quickly they set up a visit, brought him on. You had recruits tweeting at him, you know, uh, Trace Jackson Davis, uh, most notably. Uh, it, it seems like that there's a lot of momentum for that. If Bronk's going to be there, if Trace Jackson Davis is going to be there, if Race Thompson's going to be there, who we know Archie Miller really likes, I don't see a whole lot of playing time for Jake Forrester and Clifton Moore in their future, especially given that Brunk is a two-year guy off of his transfer. If he was a one-year guy, maybe it makes sense for Jake to stick around and develop for another year. But it really doesn't make sense for him to sit there and be um, you know, sitting behind a bunch of guys uh, <clears throat> that he either has as much time left as or almost as much time left. So I, I think both of those transfers make a lot of sense. Uh, VJ Blackman transferring. I mean, you know, I think VJ should go find a place to play if he can for his, for his final years. Uh, but you look at the roster turnover and, and somebody, I think it was Chronic Uger said that nine of 17 spots are now going to be open. But the 18 guys that are coming, the eight guys that are coming back out of that group are exactly who you wanted to be back next year. Um, you've got Rob Finnessy. You've got hopefully Jerome Hunter. You've got Race Thompson, Deron Davis. Devontae Green, Justin Smith. I mean, the guys who played a lot this year are going to be back next year. So it's not like they're, they've are they lost a big piece in there anywhere. And you're hoping to add guys. And actually, some of us were thinking, you know, I hope an extra roster spot or two are available because, so it's not just a two-man class, maybe a three-man class. We kind of wanted some transfers, some veterans to come in here. And there are a lot of good transfers out there. Uh, this has been a very big transfer year. Villanova just lost its five-star point guard. Uh, J Javon Quinterly. Uh, Alabama's losing Kyra Lewis. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of guys out there who are really good. Um, maybe IU doesn't dip their toe in on any of those guys, but there's a lot of good guys out there uh, to potentially bring in. So I would say that, yeah, uh, turnover, by the way, is natural at a big program. Um, but I also think that that it can be 
a, a good thing. I think it can be a good thing for the players and the coaches. And I hope that Jake and Clifton find a place where they can play. And, and those are guys with potential. I hope they find a place they can play. I just think they're behind guys here who we know are better than them and are higher level players than them. And if you look at the recruiting rankings and you look at the performance on the court, that has held up. And Trace Jackson Davis is going to jump both of those guys in the rotation next year. He just is. He's a fantastic player. He might jump race in the in the in the uh, rotation next year and be a guy who's going to be here for two, three years and be a dominant player. And so seeing those two guys play against each other in practice and everything is going to be great because it's going to get to see them battle each other. But those two guys doing that in practice is also going to leave Jake and Clifton out in the cold. So I wish those guys the best. They were great citizens while they were here. They were great representatives of the university. They need to go find their find their home and, and go find a place where they can play. All right, here's what we're going to talk about this week. We'll talk a little bit more about Jake and Clifton transferring and Romeo going pro and what that means. Then we'll discuss IU's recruiting targets and reflect a little bit on Romeo's freshman season. And then we're going to answer your questions, including one about scheduling and another about Calvert Cheney memories, which should be uh, fun to answer. All of that coming this week on Assembly Call Radio. But before we get to all of that, let's talk a little bit about sleep and why you need to buy your next mattress from our friends and fellow IU grads and fans at Comfort Option. First off, they will actually come to your house. Seriously, if you live in Indy or Bloomington, you can schedule Comfort Option's revolutionary in-home mattress service. There's a van with a bed in it, and they just put the mattress together right there, and you lay on it, and you decide if you like it or not. Yeah, plus... They don't charge you extra to come build the mattress at your house. They don't. And if you don't live in Indy or Bloomington, you can still order one of their Alpha mattresses online, and they'll deliver it anywhere in the U.S., Longtime Assembly Call listener Megan Mahaffey, whose voice that you just heard, she and her husband went with the Alpha Medium. We've been really, really pleased with how the Alpha Medium has felt. I am physically sleeping better. Also, Megan's husband no longer snoring, which is a massive bonus, obviously. And to top it all off, Comfort Option offers a 3090 satisfaction guarantee to make sure that you love your mattress. Bottom line, they want the mattress buying experience to be more pleasant than it has ever been. The whole thing, start to finish, went incredibly smoothly. So go to comfortoption.com right now and either order your alpha mattress or schedule your in-home mattress store service today. And when you do it, use the promo code assembly to get $50 off your purchase. Again, comfortoption.com, promo code assembly for $50 off. Get the mattress that's right for you. Don't leave your sleep to chance. It is too important. We want you to live. Yes, we definitely do. Can we get some basketball, please? Yes, we can get some basketball. We're back to talking basketball. By the way, I do want to be completely clear because someone did ask in the chat mob. Ryan never actually thought Romeo Langford was on a two-year plan. That is, it's a long-running joke back from like the third season of the show when Ryan did think Noah Vonley was on a two-year plan and no. will defend that erroneous take to this day. <laughs> Here's what I will say. Somebody told Ryan that Noah had planned to be on a two-year plan and changed his mind. Yes. So that's, so that's where, where that's where that comes from. But yes, from. it's a funny, it's a funny drop. I get it, but not the Romeo one. That's just misleading. Romeo Langford was on a two-year plan. <laughs> Thanks, not sir. not the best sound editing, but hey, I had to do it quickly. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about Clifton and Jake transferring. And let me pose this to you, and Andy, I'll start with you. Of those two guys, I mean, I think they both had potential. I think, you know, we were both we're both curious how they will be as players as upperclassmen. Which one do you think Indiana fans are more likely to regret not having, say, in 2020, when those guys would be juniors or seniors? Because I posed this question in our discussion community, and 83% of respondents said Jake, 17 said Clifton. Where would you side on that? Like, who do you think has the most upside and would have been better long term in this program? I would say Jake. Maybe that's just a you've seen one year less of him, but I guess I would go back to. Uh, you know, with Clifton, I don't know that he was ever a great fit, um, and but. Regardless, I think there were opportunities for really both of these guys this year. Had they been, again, I, we all have to assume this, playing well enough in practice and picking things up quickly enough, they, there were minutes to be had with all the injuries and things like that, and they were really not able to find the floor in that case. And I, you could probably even make the same argument with Clifton a year ago that as a freshman, yeah, that was maybe a tall ask for a, a guy coming in to be, be able to step in. But I guess I would say you know, he had two years to really – you know, find a way to carve out some minutes for himself and, and wasn't able to do it. And maybe that system fit or, or not, a, you know, just not a great fit for his skill set. So uh, certainly for a guy like that, you you look for him to find some place where he's going to get more playing time 
likely at a lower level. And, uh, and we've seen guys have success in, in doing that. And so hopefully he does as well. But I think you could see at least from a, you know, energy standpoint, kind of raw w- was the way that Forrester was described by a lot of people uh, coming in and, and just seemed like the kind of frontline guy that would fit well as a rim protector in the, in the system that Archie had. So you could kind of, to me, it was easier to visualize what a progression over a career would look like for a guy like Jake with the skills that he had, the energy. Um, it, it was easier to tell yourself a story about how he would really be able to grow within the program in that regard. But um, like we said, you can also go back and, and look and, and you know, kind of in retrospect, think about, hey, if you put yourself in his shoes, uh, was there a really clear path to playing time even this year? I don't know that there necessarily was, um, you know, barring, you know, a few other things needing to happen, I would guess. So I kind of get it. But yeah, I think Jake, just based on, you know, kind of system fit uh, would be the one I would miss more. Ryan, are you on the same page there? Yeah, I think it's Jake just because of yeah. the energy, the athleticism, uh, his ability maybe defensively uh, with that energy and athleticism if he got more playing time uh, and his his rebounding ability. And I think that those well, Clifton be- showed some energy and athleticism, too. He in did. His, in his it, minutes the, out there. The problem with Clifton was it, it's almost like we don't know what he can be. That's a huge lump of clay that has not been developed. And, and he's a guy who he can handle the ball a little. He can shoot a little. But. Does he want to be a back to the basket guy who occasionally steps out? Does he want to be a Kevin Durant type who plays facing forward? I mean, you know, it's it really I, I think that somebody needs to harness his skill this summer and really drill into him what style of player he wants to be because we've seen so many different things. Just watching his high school highlight tapes and watching what we've seen from him on the court uh, in short bursts at Indiana, it, it, there just isn't a coherent fit of what he wants to be whereas jake i thought the 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 path towards success was pretty simple and it's you develop his offensive game slowly from the inside out and you work on you know things like screening defense you know things that he can do you know instantly and then you work on his ability to score the basketball from the inside out you know on non-dunks because we know he could duck it we know he could put it home uh he did have that last dunk that was pretty great in uh it was one of the NIT games, I think, where he just you know went down the lane and, and hammered it home. But um, you know he could do that. Uh, but you, somebody needs to develop him as an inside scorer and then slowly move out to a jump shot because um, you know that's obviously not something he does well right now. But he, he, you know, the path to developing him into a really good Big Ten player was there and it was laid out. And there are some people today saying, you know, here's hoping he doesn't find a fit and comes back and doesn't, you know, doesn't you know, enters the transfer portal and decides to come back. So he already we'll, said, he said bye though, officially. I, I know, I know, but I, who knows what's going to happen. But, uh, I, you know, some people are saying that because they like Jake and they like what they think he can bring. Uh, that was really my point is that people are hoping that, you know, yeah. he doesn't find a transfer spot, but uh, I agree. I think that it makes the most sense for him to leave given who's coming in and, and who's already there. And, and, you know, if race Thompson doesn't red shirt, and maybe he's a sophomore and he's a year ahead of Jake, but they're the same year. And race is clearly the guy who is, you know, done better in the coaching staff's mind. So we got a question from Jeff. He said the first two players to opt for transfer aren't surprising to most fans. Is there another shoe to drop? You know, obviously, you know, Romeo left, but we all expected that, you know, I would not be shocked by anything just because it's college basketball and guys transfer all the time. But I think now, you know, Romeo's leaving. You've got two guys that have announced they're going to transfer. Again, I wouldn't be shocked, but I, I I would be surprised if we hear of anybody else, especially by this point. Like you would think that it would have come out by now. Or you and, and I think feel the same after another week or two, I think we'll all feel safe that nobody's moving on. Uh, of course, it'll depend on who comes in. I mean, if another player yeah. comes in and another player feels like they're going to lose their playing time to them, then, yeah, maybe uh, we do see somebody else exit. But it, I agree with you, Jared, that by now you probably would have heard. Uh, I was surprised that Jake News took this long to come out. I, I was looking at it today and thinking, uh, wow. Or the other day, I guess, when the news kind of leaked, I, I was kind of thinking, wow, that, that took a while. Uh, it's usually it's right after the season. But some guys aren't planning on transferring. Then they have their exit interview and decide, you know, moving forward, that's what they want to do. Uh, I think with Clifton, it was boiling for a while, and it was probably coming for a while and so that makes sense uh, i mean the fact that romeo lankford didn't announce to the mb for the nba until today was was pretty incredible um because we all knew he was leaving i i've still heard repeatedly that he's not, doesn't plan on hiring an agent right away so i don't know what that means but 
he doesn't really need to. Um, his dad's going to handle everything. Yeah, his dad will probably handle everything. And and honestly, I don't know why anybody, uh, you know, hires an agent right away unless you're just a hundred percent convinced you're gone. And because anything can happen at the combine, we know uh, Romeo's having surgery on his hand as well. Um, so yeah, I, this, it, this stuff, I mean, the season's been over for a week now, this stuff usually leaks out right after it ends, but I would say after about another 10 days, I, I'd say we shouldn't expect any more transfer news. Um, but who knows over the next few days, what happens? Yeah. All right. Coming up on the assembly call, we're going to assess Indiana's current list of targets in terms of both priority and likelihood of coming to IU. And then we'll spend some time reflecting on Romeo's one year in Bloomington. What is the lasting impact? Is there a lasting impact? We will discuss that next. Stick with us here on the assembly call. Welcome back to the Assembly Call. You can find all of our content at our website, assemblycall.com. And if you ever want to participate in our unedited live broadcasts, chat mobbers, or watch those replays, then check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash assemblycall. As chat mobber Chad once put it, hearing the stuff in between, you get to know you guys a lot better. Like the time last Thursday when Ryan kind of showed off his sensitive side a little bit. Between that and podcast on the brink, that's plenty of content to fill for the off season. We don't do cop podcasts on the brink, so no, no. Been, but I mean, I've never been a guest on that show, by the way. Still, thanks, guys. Oh, do you want to be a guest on that show? Uh, hopefully, you're hopefully you're finally getting the hint. I mean, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, I, know. I, I guys, I'm resigned. Uh, so Ryan resigned, but he's back. So he entered the transfer protocol, pulled it back. Maybe like maybe some time this off the, like a cockroach after the nuclear holocaust. You're gonna have so much trouble getting rid of me. <laughs> Maybe this off season we'll do a special edition podcast on the brink. Ryan Phillips mailbag. Ask him anything. Uh, I'm Jared Morris here with Andy Bottoms and Ryan Phillips. So we got several questions, obviously, about the guys that Indiana is targeting. And so, you know, I thought we would just take this, uh, Ryan and Andy, with, you know, kind of who we think are the, the priorities. And again, you don't want to get too serious about guys until you actually hear about visits. So this list is, you know, kind of short, but right now this is kind of all we have to go on. You know, I mentioned a lot of them at the top of the show. Trendon Watford from the class of 2019, Lester Quinones, uh, Harlan Beverly is another guy, has done an unofficial visit, hasn't done an official visit yet. I think he just got offered by Kansas. So, you know, his recruitment is kind of stepping up. And then you've got Joey Brunk, the grad transfer, Jalen Windham, a guy in the class of 2019. There's been a lot of speculation about him uh, from Ben Davis, decommitted from Georgia State when uh, when Ron Hunter went to Tulane or Tulsa, wherever he went. Uh, and then you've also Tulane. got got Daniel Utomi, uh, a 6'6", you know, kind of like a small forward in a power forward's body, or power forward in a small forward's body from Akron, who's a pretty good three-point shooter. So let me ask you, uh, Andy, I'll go to you first. As you look at this in terms of priority, I mean, all of these guys, I think, could fit, you know, specific roles. But if you had to list out kind of your priority, you know, for what how, what would you list that as for these guys? I, I think Quinones is interesting because of, you know, being a, a guard, somebody who can, you know, kind of play make on the wing and a decent shooter from uh, what it sounds like. I think that makes him potentially the most intriguing. I mean, as we've talked through biggest hole on the roster wish list whatever you want to call it i think wing wing or backcourt score was pretty high on everybody's list so that that's probably where i would lean um the watford i think from a overall ranking standpoint is is good and i think he could fit that bill uh a bit as well uh and with the front court getting a little bit thinner uh you know i would say those two guys just because you you could potentially have them for a few years yeah um but you know, I think there's there's things to be intrigued by with the others. You know, Brunk is a two year grad transfer. Uh, to me, makes him more interesting, and is a lot more interesting now that you've had some of the other guys leave. So those would be the maybe the three out of that. I don't know enough about uh, Itomi to really have a good good handle on it, other than what I've what I've read, which seems like he might be able to fit a little bit of that, but also maybe a, a bit of an you know kind of undersized power forward guy that I don't that seems like a little bit less of a great fit potentially um than what you'd have but um i i would say the the two freshmen or the two incoming freshmen um would be at the top and then maybe brunk shortly thereafter yeah i mean i, I think 
look, when we only had one scholarship open, you know, you kind of debate Brunk. You know, is that really the biggest need? But now that Clifton and Jake are gone, you know, and you know you're going to have Brunk for a couple of years, I think he is a an important priority and seems likely. You know, so and he kind of fits both of those he, bills. He also provides some insurance against Duran not Huge. getting injured again and and all that stuff. So I think that that's why Brunk has sort of elevated on that list now that other guys have left. Uh, my opinion. Um, you almost have to put these into two categories is you need a post player now. I mean, with, with yeah. guys leaving. So I would Brunk is, is kind of a must get at this point. Um, I wouldn't put him as the top priority. If you're looking for what resources you're going to put into it um, as far as talent goes and skill and everything, but you need a post guy. And so you kind of Brunk has become, it's almost like you're recruiting two different sets of guys. One of them is Brunk and you've got to, if you go get him, you have a two year guy, he's a backup plan for uh Duran Davis. He's also a guy who, you know, gives you another post guy who can practice and and you know, he's 6'11. He's a guy you can have your younger guys who are maybe smaller like Ray Thompson, Trace Jackson Davis go up against daily in practice. He's well-rounded. He's played in college basketball before and he's an effort guy. So you kind of look at that and you're like, "All right, that's a guy we can have around. Great practice player, you know, likely a great practice player and somebody who can provide you something uh, and, offensively." And even if Duran's healthy, you need someone who can play 16, 17 minutes minutes you know and spell like, him. yeah yeah of course um as as for the other guys I, I would put brunk kind of in a category by himself because of that issue yeah. um i would say quinones is number one because of his shooting ability it's over trending see i think trending's the this top is, priority this is what i'm gonna this is what i was gonna say i think quinones is number one as far as direct need as far as ability overall and what he can do for the program long term, probably Trenton Watford is number one. But if you're looking at just straight priorities, Quinones is a great shooter who you could get to come in and fit in with that young backcourt, especially with Romeo now gone. I mean, we all knew that was going to happen, but you know, now that it's official, uh, they're going to need a scoring you know option from the backcourt unless all these other guys really develop. So I would say Quinones and Watford really one A one B, but Quinones really fits. Uh, with what they're trying to do. Watford's the best player out of these guys, I think. I don't think there's any question about that. But just as purely a need and fit thing, Quinones is very important. Um, If they don't get Watford or Quinones or Beverly, which is certainly possible because these are late recruitments. You never know how these are going to go. I think Jalen Wyndham's a really nice player. I think his stock has elevated big time since he made his commitment to Georgia State. Um, And I think he's a guy who can shoot it. He can do some things. Uh, if that's not a bad fallback option, it really isn't. He's a pretty good player. Now, look, is he going to come in next year and light the world on fire? No, it, but he's I mean, a guy. Kihei Clark for Virginia was ranked in the 300s. You know what I mean? So you yeah. got to be careful with those so, some of those rankings. Right. It's not all about the rankings. A lot of it's about player development. And you've seen that a lot in this tournament. And I wrote a piece this week on the big lead and you you tweeted it out. So thank you, Jared. But about how there are no one and done teams, the one and done players in the final four. There are none. And, and, and a lot of these guys are guys who Maybe some of them were good recruits. Kyle Guy was a good recruit, but he's developed and become a much better player. You look at Michigan State. They've got guys who have developed and become better players. Kenny Goins was a walk-on. Like, you know, I mean, Cassius Winston was highly rated, but he's become so good because of the development there. Texas Tech lost five starters, developed all their guys, and look at them. You know, they've become a, a, yeah. a you know a powerful team there. So I think that... And Auburn, again, Auburn, guys that everybody else missed on. You know, these guys all came up. They don't have the size. They don't have the shooting ability. They don't have X. They don't have Y. They don't have Z. They all got better. And and they all became much better as the season went along and as their careers went along. So, again, it's it's less about the stars and more about developing. Five-star players are great. They make it. They make life so much easier because they come ready-made in a lot of situations. But you've got to develop the talent you have. Rob Finnessy may wind up long-term being more valuable than Romeo Langford was to this program because of the development and the fact that he's going to be here a long time. Now, Romeo made it okay for Trace Jackson Davis to decide to come here too. you know, And so there is value there as well. But you look at what those guys can give you, it's about developing them. And so a guy like Jalen Wyndham, I wouldn't be upset about putting a scholarship on a guy like that. He can no. play. He's a tough guy. Uh, he and Armand Franklin would be fun to add to the backcourt, I think. Um, but if you're looking straight priorities, I think Quinones is number one. I think Brunk is in there number one as the post guy. Um, you'd love to get Trenton Wofford. I think that would be awesome. But if you're looking yeah. straight at priorities, getting Quinones on campus is a big deal. And again, like Indiana is not leading for any of those guys. It still seems pretty unlikely that they're going to get any of those. But I would like to see one of those three 
you know, kind of highly rated guys who are in the class of 2019, Trendon, Quinones, or Beverly. I'd like to see us get one of those guys. And then, you know, Brunk, a guy like Wyndham. I think that would be a really good balance for, you know, for how you use those. Or if there's another grad transfer, you know, a, a an older guard that you could get that could help shore up your backcourt, something like that, that would be nice too. So we'll have to see what else develops because I'm sure some other names will pop up on the radar screen as we move forward. So I want to talk a little bit about Romeo, and I think you know we'll probably end up doing a full episode on this because it's going to warrant more talk. But you know it all kind of came down, uh, you know, just earlier today, so we didn't have a ton of time to prepare for it. But you know, Andy, as, as Romeo announces, and look, we knew it was going to happen. But I think the one wrinkle that we found out about today was that you know he dealt with a torn ligament in his wrist since November, had surgery on it today. Apparently, um, does that at all change? you know, how you view his performance as a freshman, the season as a whole, and, 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 you know, just as you reflect on Romeo, what, you know, what do you think his legacy is that he's leaving at Indiana after one season? For me, I don't, I don't feel like it changes a great deal. I, I think everybody had some, you know, he, he had that cast on it a little bit in the, uh, in the summer and, and he had it wrapped most of the year. So I, I think, probably would have been naive to think there wasn't something there. I mean, maybe the extent of the injury, no one really knew, but you knew it was something that bothered him. You saw him kind of flex it and move it around a little bit while he was playing and and during games. So I think you knew that it was something that was bothering him. Uh, And and I don't think you you really know until presumably you see him in the NBA, how much that really affected his shooting. Because for, for those of us who, watched him predominantly at IU and not a ton in, in high school other than, you know, highlight tapes and things like that. You don't really, you know, your, your context for what kind of shooter he is came from watching him at IU. So, you know, time will tell whether that's true. I certainly appreciate the fact that he, you know, played through that injury and tried to, you know, make the best of it and, and seem to carry a, a burden of responsibility for what he needed to do and wanted to do for the team. And I, I but I, I also think we've been, uh, we, haven't been as quick to kind of jump on him as, as maybe some folks do. So I would imagine there are many people whose opinions perhaps did change uh, about him. I just don't know that um, for me that was the case, but I think he was a, a guy who played, you know, came into a, a situation and played tons of minutes. I mean, as you look, he was 85% of available minutes in conference play, which was 11th. Um, did a good job getting to the rim and, and finishing and uh, drawing fouls and, and things like that. I, I think a lot of what everybody expected from him from a basketball perspective, perhaps minus the winning. Uh, I, I thought he really delivered on and um, find it hard in a lot of ways to, you know, sit the, the the parts of the season that would be deemed as failures at his feet uh, and, and feel like he, you know, did did less than, you know, try his, try his best for IU and uh, represent the program well and, and all those kinds of things. So I don't know that it changes my opinion a lot. I would like to think or hope that perhaps it did change some others. Yeah, and you know, as, as several people have noted in the chat mob, you know, the fact that it was never used as an excuse all season long, you know, when it was, you know, obviously lingering, I think that's impressive. And you know, someone mentioned it's hard to have a legacy with one year, and it is for most guys. But Romeo's a little bit different because of the relationship that the state had with him, how big the recruitment is. And again, the answer may be like he's not leaving any legacy because Indiana didn't win. They made the NIT. He didn't even play in the NIT. He was just here. It's a blip on the radar screen. But I do think, Ryan, you alluded to this earlier that, you know, in a rebuild, sometimes that first big recruit can help get things going like Cody Zeller did for for Tom Crean. Even though, as Christian Watford was quick to point out on the Hoosier Hysterics podcast, those guys were really the movement and kind of got things going even beforehand. But Cody Zeller, from an in-state standpoint, and Romeo could have a similar impact you know, for Archie, like you said, with making it okay for those guys to go and Trace Jackson Davis coming. So that can be a part of the legacy that he would leave too. Um, but how, you know, on this day when he leaves, how are you viewing everything? Well, I, I just want to say, you don't get Trace Jackson Davis if Romeo Langford doesn't commit. And, and it's not that Trace didn't like IU, it's that somebody had to be the first. Maybe Trace would have been the first, but I don't, I don't think so. I think that Romeo picking IU in such a high-profile way was an enormous boost to the program, and we will see that play out over the years. And I don't think his legacy is set yet. What I will say about Romeo, you look at the numbers, and I know that winning is what everybody's going to remember. But you look at the numbers, and we broke them down, Jared. I mean, where is he, like, the third best freshman season of all time at IU? Or it's certainly up there. 
Um, I mean, one of the best freshman seasons of all time. Certainly. Yeah, I mean, you got Calvert, Eric Gordon, Mike Woodson. You know, I mean, those those so are the names five. that let's say that, like top five. Yeah, yeah, especially from a scoring and rebounding standpoint, those are the names that he's mentioned with. Which and, is and you look pretty with good. The, the guys who have played at IU over the years, and you say you were a top five freshman of all time at IU. That's pretty darn good. And and so for people who say like it was underwhelming, well, the team was underwhelming. The team was underwhelming in 12 of 13 games in the middle of the season. And he's certainly a part of that, but you don't put that all on him. And, and I think we certainly were tough on him at times. I certainly was about, you know, not knowing when to take over. But you also, every time you do that, you have to note he's a 19-year-old kid. He shouldn't have to do that all on his own. I, I put a lot of that on Juwan Morgan, who I love. But Juwan Morgan needed to know when to take over games as well. I mean, there's just certain... Uh, aspects of the game you have to you have to know and I think Romeo will be better for that learning about his hand I think we all knew I had heard whispers there was a there was a problem with his with his wrist and hand during the season um, he had the wrap on it all year we all knew that but really learning how bad it was and knowing that it was a torn ligament that he needed to have surgery on and not something that could just get better on its own that kind of explains some of the shooting woes uh, maybe he got used to it as the season went on because he certainly became a better shooter as the year went on um, you know not not remarkably better but better but you know for a kid to play through that he could easily sat out and and said you know i'm just gonna sit out he was an nba draft pick last year before he ever you know he was a lottery pick before he ever entered iu he didn't have to play this year to be a lottery pick he could have just used iu's facilities and rehabbed and you know we could have heard about how great he was in practice and that would have been that but no he wanted to play for iu he got on the court and he was archie's first big commit and and i think that that will hold a legacy in its own. If Archie Miller goes on and wins a national title at IU or, or has like a great career at IU, uh, you will look back to that signing ceremony and how excited this state got and pumped up it got behind IU. And you're seeing guys like Armand Franklin and Trace Jackson Davis represent Indiana already, it, it, you know, by traveling up to Keon Brooks's ceremony and things like that. Even a guy who's not going to go where they're going to go representing the state and trying to be that next ambassador at Indiana to represent the state as Romeo was. And I think that might be his legacy is that IU players move the needle in this state more than anything else, Uh, more than the Colts, more than the Pacers, more than, you know, maybe Peyton Manning did more, but you know, without a superstar in this state, honestly, IU players move the needle more than anything else. And, And I think Romeo committing to IU was an earthquake and everybody heard it and felt it and um it kind of brought that back because that had been lost for a while yeah well like i said this is a topic that we will address more uh coming up in the off season but i think we're all in agreement and i'm sure most of you listening are too that you know we wish romeo nothing but the best uh as he prepares for his nba future and we'll all be cheering him on wherever he gets drafted and wishing him uh, a, a wonderful career which he's certainly capable of having All right, coming up in our third segment, we're going to answer your questions, which include one about how the selection of this year's NCAA tournament field might impact IU scheduling next season, and another about Calvert Chaney, who received a long overdue honor this week. Stick with us on the Assembly Call. Welcome back to the Assembly Call. I'm Jared Morris. I'm here with Andy Bottoms and Ryan Phillips. Remember that you need to be subscribed to our email newsletter. We send out a weekly IU News Roundup, even during the offseason. And then after games, once those start up again, we send out a detailed post-game analysis. There's a high-level operation going on out there. All you have to do is text IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com. That's IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com to join. Make no excuses. All right, so it is now time for our mailbag. uh, And all questions here submitted via our private IU basketball discussion community, which you can learn more about at assemblycall.com slash community. So we got a scheduling question from Jay, which I will ask here in just a second, Andy, and get your perspective on it. But we also had some interesting scheduling news uh, today as it was confirmed that Indiana will be in the Maui Invitational for 2020. Nice little low recruiting pitch that you can add there, maybe for Trendon, Lester, or Harland. Hey, you guys want to go to Hawaii? We're going to be going there uh, in 2020. So the field, Alabama, Davidson, Indiana, North Carolina, Providence, Stanford, Texas, and UNLV. One um, note. 
Uh, Indiana's last two trips to Maui, I was there. Neither were great, so we need to turn that trend around <laughs> badly. So that means you don't go this time. Are you going to Oh put no, all that I'm on going because I'm there every year. So yeah. So that's that's good news. You know, that is exciting news. Obviously, next year Indiana, you know, still has that exempt event with Arkansas, UT Arlington. Is it all the same teams? UT Arlington and UC Davis? Or do the, those teams rotate and it's just Indiana and Arkansas are the same? I have Indiana. No idea. Knows. Okay. Well, anyway, arena, arena preseason tournament next year? No, that's that's mm. our exempt event. Is that oh, okay. it's it's that yeah. tournament? And I, I don't didn't know realize if it's the that same event teams. was a multi year thing. I just thought the Arkansas I, component of it was. So yeah. Oh, I don't, I don't know. know. Maybe okay. Maybe it's not. But either way, uh, I did see that Fran Caffrey's name was mentioned with Arkansas. Uh, so wouldn't that be interesting? Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be really fun. <laughs> uh, talk about forty minutes of hell. <laughs> Uh, okay. You know, who else, you know who else was mentioned with that job? Another former Iowa coach. Oh yes, Steve Alford, right yes. there. He's he's right there. Yeah, he is. Best wishes to you, Ryan. Look uh, okay, looking so over you always. Yes, Andy. Here's the question from Jay. Given what we think we learned from the selection committee this season, what sort of approach do you expect Archie to take with building a schedule for the upcoming season? Taking into account IU already has Arkansas at home, Notre Dame and in Indy, and of course an ACC Big Ten Challenge game. Uh, you know, this year, if you look, there were 11 non-conference games and there were really four that mattered. So I, I could kind of see that formula being relatively similar. I think the 20 game big 10 schedule does put you in a little bit of a tough spot. I think there's an argument to be made this year that, you know, just some of the, some of the teams that got in and the seeds they got were based on having a, a gaudier win total. So if you factor in that, you're going to have an 11 game non-conference season next year, I think you're going to have seven games that you should probably walk in. Um, may, maybe an eighth. Maybe they stick with just those three. Um, but you also, the, they may have an idea of who the Big Ten ACC opponent's going to be. Um, but I don't know that, you know, those other couple, you know, Notre Dame was a bit of a transitional year for them this year. What do they really look like next year? Arkansas, the coaching situation is a bit up in the air. Um, so I, I think that's a that's an odd one as well. So I don't know again that you can count on those games while they are against major conference teams and they're probably not going to hurt you. I don't know if they're going to help you a whole lot. So I could see maybe trying to find one other little bit bigger name game, bigger name team to have. Uh, And I think the other thing I would, you know, I'd like to see them continue to move further away from some of these, you know, sub 300 teams, I guess from a Ken Palm perspective, there are only two uh this year but i think a few few teams outpaced where they were really supposed to be no more chicago states yeah you still had though i mean outside of the top 240 you know 246 or lower you still had six of those no five of those um so i'd like to get a little bit more away from that but i do think you saw a little bit this uh, it will be interesting to see just in general scheduling in college basketball that um on the one hand, you felt like teams were rewarded just for winning games. On the other hand, you had a team like NC State who had the worst non-conference schedule in the league or in the country get left out um, because they didn't have enough quality wins overall. So I, it, it's easy to point to the ones that are, hey, you ended up getting 2021, 20, 22 wins and that helped you get in. But I think there are other cases like the NC State case where the scheduling still matters. I thought Iowa probably got seated lower than you would have thought because their non-conference strength schedule wasn't very good. So you, you can't punt it completely and play only you know southland and swack teams and you know just ride it out from there did you did you mention the potential for a gavit games appearance i did not i don't remember how that works you you play each team i think is supposed to play a minimum of of four many yeah indiana's already played in it three years and i think every big 10 team is going to do it a minimum of four years so they could be in it they couldn't because there's eight games each year so there's a potential yeah. for a game there too, but it's like four games out of how many years? It's, it's a certain number of games within a particular period of years, right? If I remember, yes. That um, I think I think I used had one in the last two years, so I was kind of in my head thinking that maybe they would not this year, but I don't know. Yeah, like Michigan State hasn't had any because they're in the Champions Classic, so they're going to have to get covered mm-hmm. at some point, or maybe they're not going to uh, be in it. I don't know. It's an eight year deal, by the way. One side okay. note: can um can we get like Wake Forest or? maybe Georgia Tech in the ACC, Big Ten ACC Challenge next year and get it at home instead of, you know, playing Duke or North Carolina every single time? I'm going to go out on a limb and say, uh, no, that's probably not going to happen. No. It's a TV event, Ryan. It's made for TV. So Yeah, it's also made for... Never mind. Oh, no, I really wanted to hear what that was going to be. You'd have to bleep it on the radio. <clears throat> or create a drop. 
Um, okay, so next question. Uh, this is from JD. Everyone else is asking about transfers, which I get and I'm also interested in, but what is your favorite Calvert Chaney memory, story, or thing from his personal story that surprised you the most? He needs to get some airtime this week for sure because this week Calvert Chaney was selected for the College Basketball Hall of Fame. Congratulations to Calvert. I didn't even realize he wasn't in the College Basketball Hall of Fame. I figured he was as a Wooden Award winner, the Big Ten's all-time leading scorer, uh, just you know, obviously one of the greatest Hoosiers of all time. Ryan, what are yeah, your seriously, what's a guy have to do to get in there for him? No heavens? kidding. No kidding. Ryan, what is your what are your lasting memories of Calvert Chaney? I know you weren't a big Indiana fan back then, but you're certainly aware of the legend that is Calvert. Yeah, I mean I'm not sure if I have one memory. I just remember watching him a lot. Now, you know, Indiana with him was on national television all the time. And and you know, one of my earliest memories of consistently watching that red jersey is Calvert Chaney, is number forty. And 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 I'll always remember that jersey. And, and and that is imprinted on me. Um, I, I just I remember, you know, it's funny because you, you think back to teams from that era and there's always like the one player who stands out from each team, like for Duke, Christian Leitner is the guy you think of when you think of that era of Duke, him or, or Grant Hill, uh, Chris Weber or Jalen Rose from Michigan from Michigan. You know, I mean, there's just those iconic players, Larry Johnson at UNLV. Calvert is the eyes I you to me when I, when I think back and it's not Bob Knight on the sideline, it's Calvert playing and just watching him play and being amazed at what he could do. Um, and some of the dunks he had and the fin- the way he finished and the way he could shoot and everything just being such a well-rounded player. And I just remember watching him in those old school Indiana uniforms and just loving watching him. So, I mean, that's, that's really my memory is, you know, on like a Saturday when I, you would get the national television game, just sitting down and watching him and, and, you know, being all the way out here in California and still being mesmerized by him. Yeah. You know, the two that stand out for most people, I think are the shot against Northwestern that broke the big tens all time scoring record, you know, with the epic picture where you've got the Cheney needs one sign in there, which by the way, if anybody knows what happened to that sign, I want it. Let me know where it is. Uh, and then of course you've got the, that epic moment against Louisville. And I think it was the sweet 16 in uh, in 1993, where he went face to face with Morton from Louisville, and there's a great picture, and Calvert is not giving up any ground. It was just an awesome, awesome moment. You know, so those are kind of the obvious ones. I remember because I mean, I probably saw every home game he played when he was at Indiana because we had tickets back then. And I just remember, you know, when he got there, he was he kind of took everybody by surprise with how well he scored because he wasn't the most heralded member of that recruiting class. And he was such a good shooter, such a good scorer. I still remember this one time he got a breakaway dunk, and I don't remember who it was against, but he did like a reverse double pump dunk. And I was like, holy crap, this guy's an amazing athlete too, which I didn't like. He was just so smooth as a player, me being whatever, 10 years old at the time. I, I, I just didn't think about the athleticism, but he was such an incredible athlete. And then you had the great moment uh, for their senior speeches where people will remember Chris Reynolds went up for a dunk against Illinois on a breakaway and missed it. Uh, not a great moment for Chris. But then for his senior speech, he said that he wanted to actually complete the dunk. And so Calvert picked him up and, uh, and Chris was able to complete the dunk. And you know, the other thing that I remember is just he was such a great clutch player. And I looked earlier today in the tournament, in all his NCAA tournament games, and he played you know 10 or 11 games in the NCAA tournament. Uh, he averaged 21 and a half points, 7.7 rebounds per game, shot 61.3% from two and 82% from the free throw line, all higher than his career averages. And that wasn't just, you know, padding it in the first round game. I mean, he played big in big games um, and was just, you know, just such a great, great and consistent player for four years. The consistency was amazing. Andy, what, what other memories stand out to you? I think what you said is how I think of it. In some ways, the consistency almost leads there to not be so, you know, some of these like really standout moments. And maybe it's just because we're, you know, so far removed from it. But yeah, I mean, it was just night in, night out. He was just a workmanlike effort. The Morton thing still kind of strikes me because it seemed a little bit out of character. I mean, he was really intense and a guy that didn't want to lose, but he never really had shown that kind of like get in somebody's face type of emotion. But I think the team really took a cue from him in that. Uh, in that situation, that just seemed to me like, you know, a, a different level of intensity from him of that not backing down. And I mean, he was just fantastic in that game, pretty much single handedly, you know, took them out and uh, 
stole Dwayne Morton's soul in the process. So that was that was definitely the one I would have said. Obviously, breaking the record was was cool because it was kind of a you know vintage play that he had done so many times when he was there, and it was you know watching him work off of screens and and do so some of those things, just the subtle things in the mid range jump shots that today would be like outlawed and and no one yeah. would be able to do. All right, uh, Ryan. In our final twenty seconds here, why don't you respond to this question that we got from? Looks like Steve A, who wonders how hilarious is this UCLA coaching search? It's pretty hilarious. Uh, Calvert, or I mean, uh, was Calvert? Uh, Calipari um, absolutely played them. Just absolutely played them. That's it. it. We're done. No more questions. All right. And the last thing I'll say is they're going to wind up with a coach far below the station of the of the program. And that'll do it for us on this week's edition of the Assembly Call. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, be part of the chat mob, uh, join us for our, at assemblycall.com on Thursday nights for the live broadcast of our Assembly Call radio recording. And you can always subscribe to our podcast by searching for Assembly Call wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com to get our free email newsletter. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again next Thursday. Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim. And go Hoosiers. Thank everybody for coming out. All right. I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for listening to this episode of The Assembly Call. We appreciate it. And we really do rely on the support of audience members like you to keep our show going and to keep growing. And so we have set up a page on our website at assemblycall.com slash support that lists five ways that you can support The Assembly Call. And we encourage you to choose whichever method is the easiest and most convenient for you. One of the methods is donating, and so many of you have donated, and we appreciate it so much. On that page, you can choose a monthly recurring donation or an annual recurring donation or just a one-time donation, whatever works for you. And if you don't want to donate, another way to support the show is you can use our affiliate URLs, iutickets.shop or iustore.shop when you're going to shop for tickets or gear, and we will get paid a small commission when you use those links. But however you support the show... We appreciate it. Thank you.